Hello and welcome to Pathways, where you are invited to join me for a visit with leaders in personal and cultural evolution. This is your host, Paul O'Brien. Much of your relationship potential is determined by modeling those who came before you. As children, you took mental and emotional pictures as you witnessed your parents, your family, and your culture do their best to manage their pain. Through persistent observation, you began to inherit what a normal relationship looks like. But many of us were not given a good example, witnessing or directly experiencing shame, blame, abuse, neglect, manipulation, and games. You likely took on some of your parents' strategies for dealing with the pain, inheriting the same dynamics that interfere with your own capacity to experience the freedom, joy, and intimacy you deserve. Our guest today is Christian Pankhurst, author of the book, Insights to Intimacy, Why Relationships Fail and How to Make Them Work. Christian is an authority on heart-centered communication and heart-intelligent relationships. He is the creator of the Heart IQ Method, a coaching framework that specializes in group dynamics and intimacy development. This methodology utilizes circle work to accelerate personal and group awakening. Christian is the founder of the Heart IQ Academy, an online and live event professional training organization that offers a -a one-of-a-kind education by combining professional coach training along with embodied application of the Heart IQ principles. Hello Christian and welcome to the Pathways program. Thank you. I'm really, really grateful to be here. So why don't we start by asking you to tell us a little bit about your personal background and why you wrote this book, which I think is quite a monumental work. How did it happen? Wow. You know, uh, personal intimacy and the relationship journey has been an absolute double-edged sword for me in my life. It's been something that I've found great ease in and in another moment, great struggle and uh, feeling a disconnect from and this longing to master it. I remember growing up in an emotional desert where my uh, parents, they never fought, but it felt like they were on two ends of a boxing ring waving at each other, not really engaging. So it felt like two people cohabiting. And so my modeling of relationship was very much of, okay, it's pretty flat, it's peaceful, it's nothing's really going on. And I was so scared and frightened of replicating my parents' relationship that I've been on this search for this this incredible, juicy, alive, vibrant intimacy. So on a personal level, that's what's been driving my own intimacy is a search for something deeper, a feeling that there's something richer, more than normal going on. Because when I look outside in the world, that's not normal. That's not the intimacy that I know in my heart to be true. And I've never really settled for a superficial type of connection. I've always wanted to go deep. I've always wanted to feel the authenticity, the vulnerability, and to be real. Um, So that was kind of like my stirring initially Uh, and then something really powerful happened back in 2000 the year 2000 I was sleeping on the um, on the floor one night during a personal development retreat and I awoke at three o'clock in the morning and a presence this incredible feeling of connection and this white light this energy just entered my entire being And it opened my heart. It opened my entire body. I just totally felt connected to myself, to other, to everything. I just had this moment of awakening. And this energy had information. It literally felt like a download. I was given an imprint, a blueprint of a new vision, a version of what relationship, connection, community, and what belonging and coming home to our heart really felt like. And this was the birth of Heart IQ. It was an activation of my own inner heart intelligence and with it came a cellular memory of a time beyond this time where I could suddenly see so clearly a world that was possible and yet wasn't realized by 99.9% of people that were around me. And the I, I give it a name 
similar to the movie Narnia. I don't know if you're familiar with Narnia, you know, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Right, right. That, ch- that children's novel where they go into the cupboard and then they go into this fantasy world where everything is really incredible and an entire lifetime can go by and they come out and they're kids again. Um, it feels a little bit like that, that I was given this lifetime of data all in a zip drive, downloaded into my system in a period of 15 minutes. And now I've been in a place of unraveling it, decoding it. And my purpose in my life is to give people an experience of what it feels like to step into Narnia. So, you know, I work with individuals and couples, families and communities to heal their hearts to open their hearts, to become more intimate and connected with themselves, with each other, and with the world generally through this modern but yet ancient language of the heart that I call Heart IQ. I see. Now, let's talk about the content of the book. You start out with part one, um, how to become a healthy you. And there's so much uh, psychotherapy in this book. I, I found reading the book to be a psychotherapeutic experience. And I... A lot, I thought it was very interesting how in the beginning, um, just to quote the book, uh, quote, if your motivation for change is coming from not being okay where you are today, then the change will never stick as you are starting out from a place of self-judgment where you're telling yourself that you should be further along or better in some way. Now that seems so counter to the norm of, of the way that, that of, of the mentality that brings people to counseling or therapy or self-improvement. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. Are, 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 you, a, are, you, are you familiar with Star Trek Next Generation? Are you a Trekkie? Are you a Star Trek fan? Oh, to some extent, yeah. To some extent, okay. So I used to watch Star Trek Next Generation when I was a kid and something caught my eye about it and there was a repeated message that is infused in that, uh, in that, type of series and that was this that it's inherently part of our dna and our deepest essence of who we really are it's not taught it's the natural instinct of the of 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 us as a human being to better ourselves so inherent to who we are there is a deep forward momentum to be more than we are however There is also wounding and pain, disconnect, trauma and neglect that causes us to feel that we're unworthy and it creates the conditioning and the resultant idea, conclusion in other words, or cross wire as we call it, that we're not enough, that we're not okay, we're not lovable, we're not valuable. When we feel and believe that we are unworthy, when we come from that place of unworthiness, And we go, I'm not okay, I'm a bad person, I'm not enough. And then we try to change because we're so ashamed of who we are that we feel we need to put on an act. We need to do something differently. We need to show up. We need to, in fact, serve, be a healer, be a teacher. We need to do something. We're carrying a weight of so much on our shoulders. We carry so much guilt that now we have to feel like we have to give because giving is better than receiving. When we're coming from that place of, I'm not okay as I am, but if I get to do and be the things that I think other people or that I feel like make me a better person, then I will be good. If that's the conversation, change is going to come from shame and that will never stick. However, when we connect to our intrinsic goodness, the essence, the core of who we are, and we really connect to that and feel it, We don't just relax and go, oh, I'm enough and therefore I won't do anything. Somebody who rests in enoughness doesn't rest in passivity. Somebody who finally finds their own value connects to their fire. They connect to their life force. Now they're willing to take inspired action. They're these people who will absolutely change the world. They will be the visionaries. They will be the people that will go out and absolutely make a big difference and impact. But it's not coming from unworthiness is coming from value so it's not using their action as a means to prove that they're okay but in fact as a way to demonstrate that they already are I love Does that the, make sense it makes a lot of sense and, and I like the way that you tie in this uh, individual striving for uh, self-improvement um, and relationships which is really kind of a theme of the whole book 
uh, that we need others to fully thrive and heal. Uh, here's a, another quote about that. The days of the independent spiritual practice are coming to an end. Working on ourselves by ourselves provides a slow vehicle of transformation compared to the wonderful potential of growth through our intimate relationships." Unquote. So you're pointing out that intimate relationships are more than just a, a source of joy, they're also uh, the fast track for personal development. Yeah, not just intimate relationships either, actually coming together in community, in group, where we create an amplified field. You see, when, as soon as you and I or a group of people, strangers or not, come together and we connect authentically and resonate together, um, our energy gets amplified. What we feel becomes amplified. Our blind spots become easier to see. Our feelings become more rich, textured, subtle. We begin to notice what's happening. We get in touch with our heart's longing easier in an amplified field than we can outside of it. So what we begin to see is, okay, I could meditate and do my spiritual practice alone and perpetuate the myth that I have to do it on my own. Or I could be in community and actually use the amplified field, leverage the presence and love that others are giving me to open my heart deeper and greater than I can access myself. And I would say the, the only reason to be in a romantic relationship is that you can reach depths of your intimacy and heart and be more open and more loving and more free with another than you can by yourself. And if you can't, you shouldn't be in relationship. For what other purpose is there? Now then people would say, oh yeah, but to raise children. And I go, but then what environment are those children living in if there is stress, numbness, disconnect, or just mere friendship as the basis of that intimacy? That's not perpetuating love. So the purpose of relationship is, I want to move into deeper love, or deeper freedom. It's one of those two things. And if my relationship helps me be more open and loving and be more free in my life to live my deepest gift and purpose, then this relationship serves. But the moment I feel more closed, less loving and less free, then that's an indication that there is some rebalancing that needs to happen. It doesn't mean the relationship is bad and needs to end immediately, but it's, an, it's a symptom of, okay, I, I, there's something here that needs to be looked at. And if over many months or years, there's this consistent feeling like there's a diminishment, a settling for less, that who you are is less than with this relationship than when you are on your own. And the only reason you're in that relationship is fear, need, concern of being alone, not knowing if you can find somebody else, etc. cetera. Um, then that could provide or present um, a spiritual blockage to the individual's growth. Okay, so if the purpose of relationships is to help us access love, freedom, and joy, why does it seem that so many relationships are taxing and actually diminish our power instead of enhancing it? Yeah, this is the uh, dichotomy or paradox of relationships is that they become beautiful mirrors and reflectors to our own shadows, resistance, pain body gets activated because our partner is going to be open and loving and ironically you would think that we would then feel open and loving in return but it's because of the safety that our partner provides and the container of love that we create that creates the right environment for our nervous system to bring out parts of us that were previously locked away because they were unsafe it it requires an enormous amount of safety in order for the nervous system to let parts of our pain be known and be shown. So when we get triggered by our partner, the reason our partner has access to our deepest trigger is because that's where the most amount of love moves. And people confuse pain with a closure. I can be fully open and in pain. Pain does not mean we're disconnected. Pain does not mean we're closed. But a lot of people have that cross wire like, oh, I'm hurting, I'm in pain, and therefore we must be in a bad place. No. Pain in a relationship is quite healthy, quite normal. As we digest old wounds, we confront crossed wires that may or may not be true anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's uh, interesting that you point out that it's a myth that we can process or digest core unworthiness on our own. Uh, you point out that our, our sense of unworthiness was created from the disconnected heart of others 
so others will be needed to reconnect us back to our goodness. Indeed. Which is kind of uh, what you were just talking about. What, what are the defense mechanisms we use to shield ourselves from the growth that we really want? Well, the when I say the defense mechanisms, there's different parts of our defense. So there are the behaviors we do to keep others away. And those could be addictions, uh, codependent behaviors, um, actions that uh, lead us to separate our connection from our own heart and our own selves so we don't have to feel as much. So anything that numbs or disconnects us from feeling more could be defense. But I want to make clear here, that's not necessarily bad. I'm not into shaming. I'm not into judging what we do as behaviors of defense. Because what's inherent is this. Nobody ever defends unless there's a feeling of unsafety. So therefore, defense is all a it's all out of best intention to self-protect. Nobody is self-sabotaging. Nobody's doing themselves in. Nobody's um, hyper-defensive because there's a part of them that's maliciously trying to sabotage. That's a myth as well. Um, the only reason somebody would ever go into defense in a relationship or out of a relationship is they don't feel safe at the system of the nervous system. So the, the level of the nervous system. So um, we have this energetic membrane. Uh, so the way I picture it is like imagine that you're standing and surrounding you is this bubble. And this bubble is not something you can see with your eyes, but it's this membrane. It's this semi-permeable layer. It's your emotional, neurological, energetic, psychological um, defense system that's highly intelligent. This membrane is literally smart. It can filter through certain things. It will let certain things in and it will push certain things out. So let's just use the example of you're in a room and a thousand colors are coming towards you, but your eyes only see black and white because this membrane, for example, let's say it makes everything dimmer, duller and gray. All the colors are still out there, but our nervous system will only acknowledge gray because we've defended against the color. Now, I'm using this metaphorically. I'm not saying this literally. But now let's look at that emotionally. Our nervous system will automatically tell our steward, okay, your job as guards of this being is to keep away anger, keep away sadness, keep away these deep, raw emotions these, or primal or violence or whatever it is. So whenever these emotions come up, block them out and reroute them to parts of the nervous system and in the body so that I don't have to be conscious of them. So another way our defense shows up is through this protective membrane that lets certain things in and certain things out, but it diminishes the amount of connection we'll feel. It diminishes the amount of love, the, the color, the vibrancy, the juiciness of life. Our hearts will literally be dimmed our brightness will go down because of our defense. So the work that I do is an embodiment practice to help people awaken their heart and to come into deep safety in their nervous system so they naturally open without technique because that's another big thing that I see happening in the personal development space is, you know, this addiction to techniques. Let me tap this away or just need to change my belief systems or perhaps I can do this core stress release technique and then that will be it and I can be free and yet no um, freedom doesn't come through technique we need to tap into the level of beingness we need to upgrade our consciousness um, and that can't be done through a quick fix or uh, th that is an ongoing practice and I would argue it can't be done alone right. or through reading you know one, one type of uh, you mentioned addictions and um that's certainly one type of defense, and as you say in the book, addictions become the device we use to soothe our pain. In this sense, they are appropriate and were put in place to protect us, but once we have learned to receive love and to connect with our own inherent goodness, the addiction will move on. Now that is a very hopeful um, way of looking at addictions. Indeed, and um, I want to add one more thing to that because there was another part that needs to be named that was in the book, and that is addictions are the 
the safe way that we will find to receive. You see, we, we, our hearts and our bodies and our being, we must be fed. We must be nourished. We must be felt and, and, and receive the energy either from the divine channel or from other people. So either from vertical or from horizontal, we need to receive energy. And if our hearts are closed, we'll sti- we're still going to be hungry. So addictions are the alternative way in which we receive without having to open the heart. This is really important. It's the way in which we receive without opening the heart. Right. When, we, when we open the heart and we allow energy to move through the heart, addictions will naturally not dissolve and they all disappear. We still get addicted, but the addiction is now to our own goodness rather than to heroin, mm-hmm. cocaine, mm-hmm. alcohol, now, cigarettes, shopping, chocolate, right. whatever that might be. Now, you were talking about technique and you were, you, versus uh, uh, awareness of being, and there's this art that you teach in your work of, of watching your inner world uh, that you call tracking. What is this tracking? Um, tracking is the combination of witnessing whatever is moving in the present moment while connecting to your embodied juice of your present moment feeling reality, your feeling body. So think of it as inside of your um, body right now, there is a mixture of feminine and masculine energy that is circulating like an engine of um, polarity inside of you, positive and negative charges. This is like an internal engine of juice. Now, the masculine part of you will be inherently witnessing and siding with the consciousness of your being. Therefore, it's the container, the witness, the beholder of all there is. And the feminine inside of you will be the part that animates, moves. It's the juice. It's the life force. It's the emotion. It's the flow. It's a surrender. And we have both in different degrees, whether we're men or women, male or female. It doesn't matter. It's not about a gender thing. I'm talking about there are, there are two points of life energy. There's the observer and the observed, the witness and the witness, the masculine and the feminine. And we do have both of these inside of us. And therefore... Tracking is your skill to integrate these two um, parts of us. So the feminine and masculine, the masculine witness and the feminine embodied awareness, uh, the embodied um, connection to what we're feeling. Can we feel what we're feeling and be aware of it and be fully witness in it without getting hooked in and caught up in the drama simultaneously? And we call that embodied awareness. So a lot of people practice awareness skills, you know, in, through meditation or through Um, just mindfulness and yet there often is a lack of embodiment that comes along with that there's almost like detachment is preferred to involvement and yes to get totally sucked in to our own pain our own emotion and get lost in it that is suffering and yet there's a there's a way for us to feel our feelings and be really in the body with them while witnessing them simultaneously and that is what tracking gives us and that actually gives us then the ultimate path to emotional manifestation because if i know that i can witness and feel all of what i'm feeling at the same time and love it all the entire range my shadow range my light range dark light the whole contrast and i don't have to be fearful of any part of the emotional spectrum i can hold and love and breathe it all in as me then i am a free man and a free woman i can be all of who I am, I can give my gifts fearlessly, holding nothing back. Well, it's amazing how quickly the time is going here. When we haven't really discussed much of part two of the book, which is a huge part of the book, how to become a healthy couple. And in that, in that, uh, <laughs> there's so much information there. There's no way we could cover this. We, we, we're going to have to have a couple more shows. But what <laughs> the kind of the theme of how to become a healthy couple is heart-centered communication is one of the most essential life skills you can learn and you have so many uh, exercises in there uh, for people and one of them um, and and you also and for groups too uh, there's this thing that you call circle wisdom Uh, why don't you describe uh, how that is a, a manifestation of a group's collective intelligence and why it's so important yeah 
so actually circle wisdom's probably been my biggest teacher in my life actually um a lot of people ask you know who are who are your teachers and i've had some incredible human beings as mentors over the years and yet the teacher that has taught me the most has been circle wisdom itself so what basically happens is when you get say eight ten doesn't really matter the number of people together and you have resonance this is really important resonance isn't agreement resonance means you are all dropped in at the level of presence you're present with each other and your hearts are open so from that place what happens is that an amplified field is created where the higher intelligence of our higher selves our guidance whatever you want to call that part of us that is intuitively connected so right now each of us have help we have and some people call that whether it's angels whether it's guidance whether it's um, our higher wisdom our higher selves whatever name we give that we each have to our disposal if we have uh, the willingness and the capacity to tap into that um, we could access that when we're in an amplified field all of the individual's higher selves connect into like an inner net, a network of combined intelligence that's greater than any individual on their own, which means, for example, when I'm in an amplified field, my higher intelligence and wisdom may not come through me, but it may come through you. So if I have a question, if I want to learn or see myself, all I need to do is find the medicine that exists in the group because my higher self might use other people in the group to feed back to me what I need to see, hear, and feel. Well, Christian, I would love to talk a lot longer, but we've basically run out of time. Let's be sure to tell our listeners about your website. Yeah. So if you go to www.heartiq.com, H-E-A-R-T-I-Q.com, and if people click on the calendar, they can then find the events, including the one in Portland. Okay, beautiful. www.heartiq.com. Heart IQ is all one word. Yeah. Well, for those who tuned in late, this is your Pathways host, Paul O'Brien, author of Great Decisions, Perfect Timing, a book that shares the theme of Pathways, which is personal and cultural evolution. In a second, I will tell you how you can rewind and replay this entire interview anytime you want via the internet or via podcast on iTunes and other servers. Today, we have been visiting with Christian Pankhurst, author of Insights to Intimacy, Why Relationships Fail and How to Make Them Work. And Christian's going to be in town on March 21st uh, in the morning from 9 a.m. to noon to uh, demonstrate and teach what we've been talking about today. I want to say thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into the Pathways interview program, which is broadcast and streamed via KBOO.FM Sunday mornings at 8.30 a.m. USA Pacific Time. Podcasts of today's show, which you can listen to and forward to others, are also available for free at divination.com spelled D-I-V-I nation.com and on iTunes and other podcast outlets. This is Paul O'Brien reminding you to tell your friends about Pathways Radio and Podcasts. And thanks again to Christian Pankhurst and to all of you listeners for tuning in and being a part of the Pathways experience.